Today I'm going to talk to you about how to design APIs for humans by leveraging user experience methods and techniques to create rich interactive experiences. There are a total of about 46 slides in the talk total and should take me around 20 to 25 minutes. I know it's right before lunch, we're all very hungry, so I want to make sure that y'all are prepared for what is in store in this pre-lunch presentation. Um, I do work for Ad Hoc, which is a civic tech firm based in the States in Washington, D.C. Our company is focused on developing and delivering and operating fast, stable, and well-designed digital services on behalf of our U.S. government clients. If you'd like to discuss uh, opportunities at or with Ad Hoc, please feel free to come chat with me after this talk or throughout the conference. I also wrote a book back in 2014 called Lightweight Django, which focuses on building APIs using JavaScript and Python as well. And uh, if you'd like a copy of that book, I have some coupon codes to be able to receive a copy of that. So there's something that I've been thinking a lot about lately in our work today in APIs, and that we really haven't given much thought about. We talked a little bit about the developer experience and the needs of developers and the people who benefit from our APIs as developers. But what about the end users, the people that are actually uh, going to be interacting with the services and products that we're creating? Most of the time we start building our APIs by determining the technical architecture, the CID, CD pipelines, and other engineering focused aspects of API design. My concern is that if we continue to build APIs with zero connection to end users, we are creating a silo of data that only suits the needs of the task at hand. We should strive to meet end users' needs in order to create data-rich applications that solve users' needs alongside business requirements. So think about it. Nowadays, data is being collected about us even before we are born, right? How much have we grown? What grade did we make on that test in sixth grade? What time was your daughter born? All data, all data points being collected. It hits every, nearly every major milestone throughout our lives too. It is collected and stored by various entities in both the private and the public sector. And APIs are really the standard for these various entities to open up their data for creating products and services. And it's important to create thoughtful and intentional experiences in this space. That responsibility is one that I feel we should take more seriously as good stewards of product, engineering, and design. And the conversation starts by us talking about human-centered design. So what do I really mean when I say human-centered design here, right? So this is Wikipedia's definition. I'm not going to read it to you. You can read the slides. So human-centered design is really a process, right? It's a process in which we uncover an understanding of our users' social systems, policies, and context of use, which inform how they use products in order to create an optimal experience to better meet their needs. This includes things like overall usability of the product and accessibility for a particular user base, sometimes also referred to as personas. So what does it look like to practice human-centered design? So there are several main categories that encompass the human-centered design practice, those listed here, such as visual design, information architecture, and so on and so forth. And here are a couple of different outputs for those that practice human-centered design and what that looks like. So as you can see, it includes both aspects from what is sometimes referred to as the traditional graphic design field and user research. So some of you may still be kind of looking at me and asking yourselves, okay, well, why is human-centered design something we should really do for APIs? How is it relevant to my work? Well, for those of you thinking that in your heads, I am so glad that you asked. This was touched on earlier in the talk. When it comes to the success of an API program, the most important metric to note is usage. Period. Are people using our API? If the answer is no, 
then what is the point of having an API program? Do I have one? Practicing human-centered design on an API program is a great way for us to understand our users' pain points and create better solutions that help meet their needs and create effective usage of those APIs by meeting the needs of those end users. When we are presented with a new problem to solve, we should start by asking ourselves, has discovery been done or need to be done on this problem? What do I mean by that? This is something I like to call the HCD or human-centered design life cycle, a method that most human-centered design organizations follow, and us at ad hoc follow as well, as we start to think of work and how we think of them in different phases. So define, discover, build, and validate. These four phases, phases make up a nonlinear life cycle that define a human-centered design practice. So let's walk through each of these phases. Starting with loosely defined hypothesis, which includes goals and outcomes for solving a specific user or persona's needs, which helps to inform the work created in the next phase. A specific example of an outcome of this phase in the traditional product practice would be something like creating a product outline, which includes a summary of where the problem stands, and this should include things like historical notes, major decisions, impact, and performance metrics as well. So that's from the product side. And I want to mention that these phases are not necessarily for designers, engineers, or product. It fits all of those different disciplines, right? The discover phase is where you can get to know the needs and pain points of current and potential users, as well as gaining a deeper understanding of our stakeholders' main concerns. The work you do during this phase will help inform everything that follows thereafter. The methods used could be anything from user interviews to a comparative analysis of a product to engineering research on around technical feasibility. All of these methods help us to discover what the best path forward is for our users. And I'll be giving you all an example of that and how that's done with APIs in a little bit. The build phase occurs once you've learned about your users' expectations and where we can create testable outcomes. This could be anything from traditional wireframes of a particular product to a user journey map that uncover the user's onboarding process. Very relevant in our API space, onboarding. These activities and methods create artifacts that we can then validate with our users to see if it meets their expectations, their needs, and their points. Now, the validate phase is where we test and retest our work with our users. This helps us build the best possible product. This phase includes methods like usability testing, A-B testing, 508 accessibility testing, as well as traditional technical Q&A, automated testing, so on and so forth. I'd like to note again that these phases are not linear nor prescriptive. There may be times where you, you kind of know what needs to be done and what needs to be focused on in the next phase, what, what needs to be built, or discovery has already been done on a particular problem. Additionally, most initiatives going through this slide will go through multiple rounds of that build and validate part of the cycle before they are completed. Now, by following these phases, we are holding ourselves accountable and each other accountable and our teams to focus on creating products and services that meet human needs, thus being human-centered. Good. Now let's walk through a specific example of these phases and how they relate to API development. The example I'll be walking through is a representative of an actual exercise that I facilitated in my work. So naming things is hard. I forgot who said this, but some famous engineer did say this, that naming things is hard, but I think it's hard in lots of things, not just engineering, but it is very hard in engineering. And uh, API development is really no stranger to this difficulty when thinking about endpoints. During my work as a user experience lead on an API program, we came across this challenge where we, we began to develop a new type of API. Now, the team went back and forth for about two weeks, I would say, about what are we going to name this API, what should the endpoints be named, and it just went on and on. And so, um, 
With these human-centered techniques, I scheduled a meeting to perform an exercise called affinity diagramming. So this took around an hour and a half to perform in which I had all of the product folks, engineering folks, design folks come together and get onto a uh, digital whiteboard, which I'll show you here in a second. So affinity diagramming, uh, for those that aren't familiar, it refers to organizing related facts into the same clusters of information. So uh, let's see. So for about the first eight to 10 minutes, I just had everybody, so this is a thing called board thing in which you can uh, put little sticky notes digitally at ad hoc or most way remote and with our clients as well. And so this is a nice tool to use when you want to do exercises like this. So I instructed everyone on the call to add what endpoints are needed as part of this new API. Now I didn't work with Harry Potter or the team at Hogwarts. Again, this is a representation of that work. So, although that would have been kind of fun. Uh, further instructions included to add one card per data point. Don't worry about duplicating cards. Like if you saw somebody write the same thing, just write it anyway if it comes to your head. And also yellow cards only. Now that last point is important because that'll, you'll see later on in the next few slides why that part is important, why they needed to be yellow. So once all the cards were added, we took the time to walk through each card and cluster them together as a team. For example, if two cards said something like facility name, those cards would be paired together. And as we walk through the cards, I leveraged my human-centered design facilitation skills to draw from the participants what the endpoints should be named and how they should relate to each other. So we started with sort of this basic simple language and then moved on to more technical language, which then ended up in this right here, where you can see, it's a little hard to read the pink one, it says facility, the facilities up there. And then you can see the added methods as well as part of the conversations, what methods would also be used with these various different endpoints. So, and the parking lot I want to add, so I think it's important not to remove any of the cards, it should leave things there, but make a parking lot to put things that don't really end up in the clusters, right? Um, and, yeah, so that's how we end up, and the total ended up to, be, again, be about an hour and a half. So we went from two weeks of something I like to call swirl, of just conversations happening, what are we going to name, what are we going to name it? to then uh, one and a half hour. And this is a direct quote from the product owner on the program about um, this exercise and how it helped the team work both collaboratively and structured, constructive way. And that we quickly came up with an agreed upon solution. And I'd like to add a note that this kind of exercise, affinity diagramming, can be used when you see any kind of squirrel uh, in order to get your team to be working effectively. I've used it in many different ways and it's been very helpful to those teams. I'd like to present you with an idea and a new and almost revolutionary concept of human-centered design by utilizing and infusing API data and architecture into the process. So raise your hand if you've read this article. Has anyone here read this? Okay, so for those of you who are not raising your hand, um, I'm going to be posting a link to my Twitter handle so that you can um, get a copy of that later. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept uh, that's presented in this article. The author talks about the common failure in our industry to establish a common language between designers and developers. Now, throughout my career, that's really been a struggle. So how do we create this common language between designers and developers? Because each discipline uses different types of language, right? So a measure curve means something different uh, than a border radius. Like if I'm talking to an engineer, you say border radius, and you understand CSS, you understand what that means. A measure curve is something maybe a designer understands, but ultimately when it comes to your designs, it's the same thing. So being able, being able to have that common language is incredibly important in order to work well together as a team. The author then goes on to explain the concept of engineering thinking versus design thinking. Engineering thinking focuses on building clear, repeatable solutions at scale. 
while design thinking aims to embrace ambiguity and iterate on concepts. Based on this, the author argues that some engineers may find it difficult to see through that design ambiguity and abstract ideas designers bring to the table, and they are more focused on executing solutions. Now, I am a hybrid. I would say I'm both an engineer and a designer, and probably a product person too, I've been told. <laughs> So, you know, for me, it's a little bit different, but I definitely see both of those sides. So now here's where it starts to get really interesting in this article. Imagine a world where designers built mock-ups with an added layer of an API schema to help start a meaningful conversation between designers and developers and data. Let's walk through an example from the article that focuses on this concept and how it applies to the build phase of human-centered design. So let's say I have this user story, a short requirements or request written from the perspective of an end user that states the following. So as a driver, I want to finish as many jobs as possible so they can earn more money in a day. After some refinement and breaking down the story into smaller chunks, we can easily visualize this happy flow for this user story. The driver opens the app, goes online, and so on and so forth throughout. So here's a breakdown of the user story one and kind of thinking of it in small chunks. So let's focus on the first activity, which is the offline view as an example. The basic user story for this requirement can be something like, as a driver, I want to see past trips when I'm not online so that I can do strategic planning on how I accept new jobs. As a next step, the author then shows us a simple, quick prototype, so I consider this sort of a low-fidelity wireframe, right, that would build to fulfill this work in the screen. And then you can see that the user is not accepting any jobs at this point, with a job summary and option to go online. And since the user is not taking any action at the moment, we'll use the get method also, the screen is largely showing all the information related to user. So the noun on our resource will be user as well. So all the associated information shown on the screen will be included in the response body that you can see here. So this will include summary data, user profile photo, and this is a representation that will be shown as a JSON list. Now here is where I'm just fascinated. Because wouldn't it be cool, imagine this, both this JSON list and wireframe side by side, outlining where each data point enters into the design. Pretty cool concept, right? This is where I think we are and should head as next steps in building human-centered design APIs. With this new concept and way of working, our teams will get closer to the data and the interfaces interacting with those designs to create more effective, solutions that impact end users' lives in a meaningful way. This translates across all industries in both the private and especially in the public sector. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I do have some concerns in the lack of direction in the way we create and shape products. So, raise your hand if you've experienced a sudden change in an API, it just all of a sudden stops working. If you're working with an API, just, it's just not working anymore. Only, yeah, everyone should be raising their hand. I don't know anyone who wants to experience that, right? Yeah, ever two hands. Yeah. So this is one of the most frustrating aspects of being an API consumer. Now, if the API, us creating APIs would leverage something like human-centered design, we'd be thinking a little bit more about that and the pain point that we all feel. So a couple of ways to do this is creating a culture of transparency. Someone said this earlier in a talk, it just like got me in my heart, it was the perfect thing to say. So creating a culture of transparency is a way to help avoid pitfalls of creating silos between product design and engineering, and ultimately our end users. So all of us should connect in order to have a human-centered design process. So one way I've done this is uh, their intentional communication with upcoming uh, interviews with end users. So uh, we use Slack. So what I'll do is about 15 minutes before we're about to do an interview, I'll say, hey, 
I'm about to do an interview. Here's a Zoom link to join. You all are welcome. Please come join. And please follow these rules that I've outlined in these emojis below. Thank you. And it's been effective. It's been very effective to the point where I have engineers that are actually running their own user interviews, which is fantastic because I'm a very firm believer that human-centered design is a team sport and that it's not just owned by one group, but it should be owned by everyone. So uh, I will note that there are sometimes people don't know if they're invited or not, especially if it's a new team. So actually adding them to the calendar invite is sometimes an even better way to have that intentional communication. So something that we've seen throughout this conference already and we'll keep seeing is documentation. And that's also part of the human-centered design process. There are people who do different things in human-centered design and different approaches to the way they are human-centered design. So document it and share it. There's an article that our creative director at Ad Hoc wrote about how we do our process. We have internal lengthy documentation as well, but this is uh, one that I'll be sharing with you all uh, via my Twitter account that you can read uh, at, your, at your leisure. So, here is my challenge to you all in this room. A year from now, I want us to come back to Paris, and I want to hear more talks about how we've le leveraged at least one human-centered design method in our APIs and to create better products for end users. Need ideas on how to get started? I'll be around the conference. I'll be around at lunch. Come talk to me, and I'm happy to help you in getting started and being human-centered. Be curious about your users and the humans you're creating your products and services for. Your insight and knowledge from leveraging human-centered design techniques and methods will set the course for creating a better, more impactful experience for their lives. Because in the end, isn't this what we all want? Thank you.